Thanks, everyone. And uh, thank you to Aspatar for having us here and giving me the opportunity to sort of share some of our data with you today. So the data that I'm going to go through is looking at some pre-season altitude training camps in Australian rules footballers. Um, and we're looking at two years of two years worth of data here. So trying to get at some of the, the variability, which has kind of been a little bit of a theme coming up um, over the past couple of days. So I guess the, the background to the question that we're looking at is that in our athletes, we've seen higher variability in their response to um, altitude training, um, both in their hemoglobin mass and their performance responses. Um, similar to, to work that other people have done and sort of the, the common theme of high variability within the literature. Um, and then Rob Chapman proposed that there would be responders and non-responders in the study that he mentioned this morning where he found that those with the greatest improvements in performance also had the greatest increases in EPO and the greatest haemoglobin mass response. So this kind of led us to our question is that we have this high variability. Um, do we have individuals that are responding the same from year to year? And if so, can we identify um, who those people are? Um, and possibly we want to focus our altitude training interventions more on those people that are going to have the best response as opposed to the people having a, a lesser response. Um, and also, what other factors might influence how people are responding to altitude training? Um, and can we explain some of the variability with um, with other variables. So our design, we had um, professional Australian rules footballers. We had 12 subjects who travelled to two altitude training camps um, separated by a year. So our first exposure was in Flagstaff, Arizona, um, just above 2,000 metres for 19 days. And then a year later, we travelled to Park City, Utah, um, one day shorter camp and similar, similar altitude. Um, we had some extra subjects in those camps. So on the first exposure, we had nine extra subjects who we didn't get data on in the second camp. And in the second camp, we had 11 extra subjects who we didn't get data on in the first camp. So some of the data I'll present, um, there'll be a few extra numbers in there besides the 12 who went to both camps. So here's look, looking at our um, hemoglobin mass uh, timeline collection. So on the first year, we had uh, pre-flag stuff and then five days post and then one month post um, looking at changes in haemoglobin mass. A little bit different on the second exposure. Um, we had a double baseline, both one back in Melbourne um, at sea level, and then we actually measured haemoglobin mass whilst we were in Park City, Utah. So we did that um, the day we arrived. Um, then we had 13 days whilst at altitude and 17 days whilst at altitude, trying to also look at a little bit of the time course um, of the response. And then again, four weeks post. So to measure haemoglobin mass, we were looking at, uh, we're using the carbon monoxide rebreathing um, technique, using capillary blood samples. We use the same OSM3 for all of the measures across the two years. Um, and we use a carbon monoxide dose of one milliliter per kilogram, but we adjusted that a little bit for the changes in the partial pressure of carbon monoxide when we were taking measures um, at altitude. And then we had reticulocyte counts and uh, serum EPO samples with some venous, venous blood samples. Um, we're using Will Hopkins magnitude-based inferences. We set the smallest worthwhile change for hemoglobin mass to 2%. Um, and then for all other measures, we used a small effect size. So here's our data. Um, this is the, the change in hemoglobin mass over the first year is in the, the blue line, the dotted blue line. And then you can see the data from the second year um, in the red line. So we had a fairly... Um, repeatable sort of mean res group response from year to year. So we had 3.6% increase um, in the first year. And then in the second year, we had a 4% increase in the group. So, so fairly similar, um, a fairly similar duration camps. One of the differences with the second year is that, as I mentioned, we did the time course whilst at altitude. Um, and we saw that 4% increase after 13 days already, which I wasn't really expecting to see it happen that quickly. But they're up at 4% after 13 days um, and then wasn't, wasn't a great deal of change when we measured it again at 17 days. Um, then after four weeks, they're back down to baseline. Four weeks back at sea level, sorry. So a couple of other markers of erythropoiesis. Um, as I mentioned, we had reticulocytes and EPO, the fairly uh, typical responses that are reported throughout the literature with a good increase in the first couple of days, coming back down towards baseline levels towards the end of the camp, um, and then suppressed below baseline levels. Um, I think that was... 18 days um, after back at, being back at sea level. 
as I mentioned, we have the, ho the high variability which others have seen, and this is our EPO data, um, showing that trend that I just showed uh, with the group response, but there was a wide range in the responses of, uh, of what was happening with our EPO. Um, and so we were trying to work out, is, is that possibly one of the things that's contributing to the different responses in haemoglobin mass? We didn't find any correlations between um, EPO response and haemoglobin mass, but probably more what we were interested in is how did the response from year one look compared to the response in year two? So we had 12 repeat subjects. Um, here I'm presenting data for nine subjects, and that's because we had three that fell ill on the second camp, which we thought was a confounding variable for their change in haemoglobin mass, and I'll present a little bit more on that in a second. Um, but we found a very weak relationship between their change in haemoglobin mass from year one to their change in haemoglobin mass in year two. So it didn't seem that they were responding consistently um, from year to year, um, at least within this, this, this group that we took um, to altitude. So besides that healthy group, which we were trying to look, do they respond the same from year to year? We also looked into a few other variables which we thought uh, might be affecting their response. And one of those was illness. So I mentioned there was three subjects in the second year who were ill. There was also two subjects in the first year who were ill either immediately before or during the camp. And this is the haemoglobin mass response for our ill subjects. So basically no increase in haemoglobin mass um, post the altitude training camp for the, for, the, for the group that was ill, whereas we had that good 4% increase um, for those who were healthy. And then uh, the group was back down, both groups were back down to baseline four weeks post. So being ill um, attenuated that, res that positive response they were getting in haemoglobin mass for our guys. We also looked into guys who were losing um, a fair bit of body weight across the duration of the camp. So I arbitrarily set um, a two kilogram sort of cutoff for, for those who were losing body weight across the duration of the camp. And you can see their loss, the loss in mass is up in the top right hand corner there. So the group that was losing more than two kilos lost on average around sort of two and a half, three kilos, while the other group was uh, fairly stable. And they had about half the increase in haemoglobin mass immediately um, post-camp compared to the group that was um, body mass stable. And then perhaps even more interestingly is that at four weeks post here, um, the group that lost more than two kilograms of body mass actually went down below baseline values for haemoglobin mass. So they're about 2% below where they started um, in the beginning. So that was quite counterproductive uh, in that sense. Um, similar to the work from Professor Roback and Professor Lundby, um, we also found that the initial um, relative haemoglobin mass was affecting how much of a change we got in our guys. We did see some positive benefit with the guys that were up higher, but not as much as what we saw with those guys that were sort of lower haemoglobin mass to begin with. Um, so that's, that's our data overlaid with uh, Professor Roback and Lundby put together um, nine studies there, it's a composite of nine studies, which I think we've seen that data before throughout this um, conference. And if we were to overlay our study sort of as a group mean, that's where it'd sit um, on their regression line. So the conclusions and the applications of this work is that uh, we think over an 18 to 19 day altitude training camp, you should see a three to 4% increase in haemoglobin mass with these um, kind of athletes. Individuals didn't seem to um, respond consistently from year to year, so we didn't seem to have a responder and a non-responder phenomenon which we could um, explain and then sort of work out who we might want to target in the future. Um, we had an attenuated response in the unwell athletes and independent of that ill health, if the, if the athletes were losing body mass across the duration of the camp, uh, they also sort of... Um, had an attenuated sort of erythro erythropoietic benefit um, and possibly even a negative benefit four weeks post, a negative effect four weeks post, sorry. Um, so thank you to everyone involved in the study. We had the football club and um, the, un my, the university, which I'm doing my PhD at, and also a lot of help from Chris Gore and his team at the AIS. So thank you. Thank you, Blake. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience now if anybody has any questions. I'll start. Um, you quickly looked at um, uh, changes in initial uh, hemoglobin mass to see if there's any change afterwards. But did you look between from year to year for those that didn't respond if there's a change in the initial uh, hemoglobin mass? 
Yeah, everyone, everyone from, he's saying for, from one individual from one year to the next. Yeah. yeah, they started at the same level. Um, so those subjects which we took to both camps were pretty much at exactly the same level okay. when we came in the next year. So there was no sort of residual benefit from the year before um, and they'd stayed fairly stable. So it couldn't have been one of the numbers or uh, non-responding kind of thing? Wouldn't of non-responding if they, if they started at a different yeah. initial? So no, they're all starting at a fairly similar level. Yep. Thank you, Martin. Um, Blake, um, something that you didn't present, and I know that you've got some data somewhere, is on the, the training load differences between the two yep. uh, camps from year to year. Are you able to give us a quick snapshot as to how different um, the pattern, even of training load or the total load or, or those sorts of things? Yeah, it was just slightly higher in the second year, um, the training load. Um, and I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, it was, it was a fairly high training load for both camps, slightly higher just go off. It's on again. Uh, yeah, so a little bit higher in the second year, which may have contributed to the slightly higher increase in hemoglobin mass, if you want to look at it that way. Yeah, so briefly, thanks a lot for this really nice presentation. Uh, can you comment on uh, the performance outcomes as well? Yep. Um, so the performance data, unfortunately, wasn't as clean uh, as I'd hoped, um, and we, we the camps are at sort of slightly different times of the year, so at the performance data that we collected didn't line up perfectly post-camp. But the um, we did get performance data four weeks post on the first year, and then it was about six weeks post that we got ended up getting the performance data the second year, and they ended up at the same level, um, same level of time trial performance in both years. So it wasn't completely clean, and the, the training loads post weren't. Um, matched perfectly between the groups, but basically our group ended up being at the same point um, at the end of our pre-season, if that makes sense. Interesting, like the first camp was five days afterwards, um, you measured hemoglobin mass in the yep. second camp, day 17, um, but you still saw a higher response in the second camp. Um, with some of the stuff we've seen with the swimming, um, that cumulative effect of multiple camps, uh, potentially if you measure day five, it might have been even higher than it was at day 17. Um, day five post? Yeah, in the okay. second camp. Um, yep. So, yeah, just your thoughts on that, whether... Yeah, I'm not sure you probably have more experience than that with me, um, than me with that. Uh, the only reason we didn't measure five days post in the second camp is because that was Christmas Day, I think. Yeah. So uh, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't get them to come in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the trend's yeah. there and I can look like it. So you think it, it keeps going higher, up a little bit? Maybe a little bit. We've seen sometimes a week afterwards it's a little bit higher than yep. straight away and um, it would go the same sort of line as some of that swimming data that I presented, the okay. cumulative effect of multiple camps. Yeah, OK. So it was cool. good. Nice study. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thanks very much. Okay, it's my pleasure now to. Uh, it's my pleasure now.